Hello, lovelies. Well, first of all, a shout out to Ray Bay West. Ray Bay, (laughs) that might be the most beautiful compliment that anyone has ever paid me in my entire life. So I just want to say thank you so much. It really, really touched my heart. (laughs) And I'm so glad that you're enjoying these podcasts. And I hope you guys, I hope you are. I guess you're here. You must be. So today I want to speak to a comment that was left on my last party about um, disagreeing with Dennis McKenna. The first thing is that I'm really excited that I got to hear about a new book, um, The Cosmic Serpent, which in a way apparently vindicates me because what uh, Jeremy found was that it was indeed a psychic slash shamanistic mode of gnosis that enabled these shamans to put these plans together. So I was very glad to hear about this book and um, excited to find that I had stumbled possibly at least in the right direction. (laughs) But there was another comment that is the one that I really want to address, and that is the suggestion that both Dennis and Terrence would admit that synchronicity played a huge role in the determination of the two plants that would need to go together for ayahuasca. Now, I am actually a huge fan of synchronicity in the respect that I think that it's indicative of and a symptom of our inborn human faculties And perhaps as a topic that we'll get into one of these days, because it really is a fascinating topic. But the implication is that the discovery of these two plants was by chance, lucky chance. Synchronicity is kind of lucky chance. Now, this reminds me of another answer that is often given when the subject of ancient Egypt comes up and the subject of the pyramids and how did the ancients know that and how did the ancients do that? And the answer that seems to be the most popular one, and I get that a lot on my Facebook page, on the Magical Egypt Facebook page if I pose a question, uh, a rhetorical question, in fact, um, the answer that comes in most frequently is bump Aliens did it. Aliens did it is one of my biggest pet peeves, and I didn't even realize it until I interviewed the great Gordon White. Gordon White has actually been incredibly instructive for me in terms of formulating my own cosmology (laughs) around so many ideas. And so I'm very, very grateful. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a little bit of that interview for you where Gordon addresses the idea of aliens. In many respects, it's an understandable impulse to look at the great holes in the official model of history and say, well, they're wrong um, because they are, that's fine. Um, And then follow it up with therefore aliens. Now, the challenge there is you're right that they're wrong but it doesn't necessarily follow that physical human beings or from another planet or even aliens or whoever the gods in nuclear powered rocket ships came down and, and, and taught us things. The model kind of fails when you take it to that level and it ultimately becomes unnecessary. This returns to 
what kind of universe you think you live in. Now, like all people of reasonable intelligence, of course, um, I'm, I'm completely on board with the idea aliens actually exist. But if you put Egypt in particular, but any of these ancient and classical cultures back into the magical worldview that they come from, if you decide, well, what if the universe is alive? What if you live in a living universe? Then a whole bunch of the things that require aliens no longer require them. And that's just parsimonious. It is, it is better to assume in the absence of aliens um, having arrived and announced themselves in any, in any real way, that perhaps it is the capacities of, of humans and spirits and whatever else you want to call it uh, in communion, which is the thing that I think we have better evidence for. I think we have 150 years of very good parapsychological evidence for things like telepathy and, and psychokinesis and, and so on. And you just, we have, we have bits of it, right? And I understand the appeal because we've all been there of, of going there for aliens. That is an indicator to yourself to, to again sit with how you think the universe is constructed. Because very often the leading ancient aliens theories rely on, on two, two things that I'm not a fan of. Um, the first one is materialism, because you're, you're looking for some sort of 1950s scientific ex explanation for how this rock can be put on top of that rock. And maybe they had like some floating land speeder thing, right? So you, you're going down a purely technological route, which is still falling for a foundational philosophical error. And the second one, and this is key, uh, racism. So if you look at the areas that seem to attract the most aliens, they're brown and, and the people pointing at them and, and saying, therefore, aliens aren't. And bear in mind, that's honestly where big chunks of what we know to be alternate history and alternate archaeology have come from. They, they came from imperial projects of simply assuming that, say, um, Indians couldn't have built the, the, the beautiful Hindu temples and castles and so on, that there had to have been some sort of invading white race from, from Central Eurasia. Bear in mind that when we fail to appreciate how incredible our ancestors are, a lot of very bad ideas can fall into that gap. So it is, it is urgent philosophical work for you to understand for, to your own satisfaction what kind of universe you think you live in before you go straight to aliens, because the aliens come bearing some, uh, some unlovely gifts. So how fabulous is Gordon? Doesn't he just hit the nail on the head? <laughs> and so as you know, or may know, I have recently moved to Thailand. And this phenomena that I am witnessing amongst our peers here in their desire to blame Things like synchronicity or chance or blame outside forces like aliens is very much akin to a mental process that one can observe here in Thailand. Earlier on in these podcasts, I apparently had an elephant fetish. <laughs> And so let's revisit my friend, the elephant, because here in Thailand, you see the impact of early training so evidently on these beautiful creatures. They really do tie them up and hold them in place with the tiniest, most flimsy piece of string. We've all heard the story that elephants get tied around the leg when they're little elephants and they pull against it and they're unable to break that string because they're little baby elephants. But even when they grow up to being huge, big, gigantic creatures, their early learning prevents them from struggling against that rope because they have been taught that that little tiny rope will keep them in place. And so it does. And so the analogy to our early education 
and our belief that we could not be capable of such things. And if we are, it's because of luck and chance and synchronicity. These kinds of ideas serve to limit our potential, to curb our potential. There are so many times that I have heard the idea, remember who you are, you're more powerful than you can believe. And it, I think I've even mentioned this before, I found this idea completely frustrating because obviously I can't remember who I am and obviously I don't feel incredibly powerful And so I have tended to think of that as mm, some mythology until (laughs) recently I came across an idea that literally blew my mind. And also it gave me an intellectual framework for me to start playing with the idea so that I can move it from knowledge into wisdom. And that idea has to do with the anthropocosm. I've also mentioned previously that I am wanting to do a podcast on the anthropocosm for you and that chance is going to help me because it is on face value a very simple subject, right? As above, so below. But what does that actually mean? And how does that become functional for us? How does that become useful for us? Well, one of my favorite authors, Joseph P. Farrell, speaks to this. In fact, when I first really got onto Joseph, I can't even tell you how many hours I spent going through an old radio show that he did. It was 30 hours possibly of content and I just dove in and listened to them over and over and over again. His mind is incredibly astute. And then I went ahead and bought a bunch of his books and I've slowly been working my way through them. And when I was digging around in Schwala's Anthropocosm, it occurred to me that Joseph P. Farrell had done some writing on this idea as well. And so just recently I picked up his book again and as you do complete another turn of the spiral, you can come back at things and have a completely different understanding. And the ideas, (laughs) the idea, (laughs) the ideas that Joseph is talking about in this book are so incredibly important, so ridiculously huge that it probably took me a year of digesting them just to be able to understand them, to come back and look at them with fresh eyes. The implications allow many of the puzzle pieces to actually fall into place. What puzzle pieces, you might ask? (laughs) Well... Let me read from the introduction to the book. This is not a typical book about mind manipulation. Most such books concentrate on its technology and techniques and upon its contemporary history, possible manifestations, and personnel involved. Few, if any, ever talk about its underlying and very ancient cosmology and the art and craft of mind manipulation that sprang from it. In this book, we will talk about all of it, the arts, the history, the technology, their manifestations, and above all, their underlying cosmology and the cosmological implications of mind manipulation. Hold up. Did he just say the cosmological implications of mind control? The cosmological implications of mind control? Now, doesn't that just 
Mm, blow your mind, right? <laughs> that mind manipulation might, in fact, have cosmological implications. Doesn't that one idea alone potentially explain the critical importance of humanity? Well, this book lays out a case for that. Let me read you a little bit of it. I'll start with two quotes that are at the beginning of chapter two that he uses to position humanity, utilizing a modern physics view as well as an ancient philosophical view. The first one, the philosopher of old was right. Meaning is important, if even central. It is not only that man is adapted to the universe, the universe is adapted to man. Imagine a universe in which one or another of the fundamental dimensionless constants of physics is altered by a few percent one way or the other. Man could never have come into being in such a universe. That is the central point of the anthropic principle. According to this principle, a life-giving factor lies at the center of the whole machinery and design of the world. That is the central point of the anthropic principle. John A. Wheeler, Center for Theoretical Physics, University of Texas at Austin. And the second quote, Although inferior to the purer spirits, man occupies at the same time an absolutely unique position by containing the whole world on a minor scale. Thus he is placed in the middle of the universe. His nature is the dividing line and accordingly, also the bond between the material and the spiritual world. He is called, therefore, notice at viniculum mundi. His uniqueness is, however, not one of ontological dignity, but one of position within the order of being, in the sense that he is called the center of the universe. So far it seems that humans play a central role in the universe to the point that the universe possibly wouldn't even exist without our observership. And I find it really interesting that one small change in the universe would mean that man wouldn't even exist at all. And so all of this kind of points again to the critical nature of humanity. But let me read a little bit more of Farrell because he does a much better job of explaining it than I do. And I really love this bit, so. It is a phenomenon of the universe that, just when the forces of materialist reduction seem to triumph, those forces of the priority of the non-material and noetic return, and usually with a vengeance, and in more potent and cogent form, than their previous articulations. Hallelujah, I hope so. It was true of the return to Platonism, as the Neoplatonists sought to incorporate the insights of Aristotle in their systems in the earlier centuries of the era, and it was even truer of the move from Aristotelian back to Platonic, Neoplatonic, and Hermetic systems during the Renaissance. Now, however, it appears that an ancient concept of man as the microcosm, as the literal little universe, and midpoint or center of the vast gauges and scales of the being of the universe at large, the macrocosmos, has returned in a new guise, that of the anthropic cosmological principle of contemporary theoretical physics. As the two epigraphs that begin this chapter illustrate, both cosmologies depart from and arrive back at the same fundamental insight, that somehow mankind occupies a central position in the vast cosmos, 
Indeed, if anything, the modern physicists pondering this idea state it with a force and clarity scarcely equaled by their early classical medieval or Renaissance antecedents. For advocates of the anthropic cosmological principle in contemporary theoretical physics, the basic features of the universe, including such properties as its shape, size, age, and laws of change, must be observed to be of a type that allows the evolution of observers. It goes much further. For the ancients, as the second epigraph showed, viewed man as the middle of the universe, uniting in his nature the incorporeal higher noetic realms with the lower material realms. He was thus the center of all realms, or, to use more modern language, the common surface of two regions. Modern physics puts a finer and sharper point on the same basic concept. The fact that the mass of a human is the geometric mean of a planetary and an atomic mass, while the mass of a planet is the geometric mean of an atomic mass and the mass of the observable universe, are two striking examples. That's not all. For these apparent coincidences are actually consequences of the particular numerical values of the fundamental constants defining the gravitational and electromagnetic interactions of physics. By these reckonings, man is the center of several centers of the macrocosm. Much more importantly, observers are necessary to bring the universe into being. Thus, the implications of cosmology, ancient or modern, for any philosophy of mind, are enormous. For if observers are necessary to bring the universe into being, then, if one can manipulate the mind of the observer, man, who is at the center of the cosmos, one can perhaps manipulate the cosmos itself. And if that be true, then any technique or technology of that manipulation, from the arts to the bizarre remote control, electromagnetic and sonic mind manipulation technologies of the past decade, assumes cosmological scale because their use or misuse has potential cosmological implications and consequences or to even put an even finer point on it. The purpose of my control is to gain cosmological and not merely social, cultural, or political power. Here's another little bit from the same book. When one translates this view to purely physics conceptions and views this assertion of microcosmism analogically, it is if what was being said was that man was a coupled harmonic oscillator who could resonate to a variety of systems from the divine down to dead matter and thus could also, through resonance, affect them. These three implications, as we shall discover, are reproduced in stunning fashion in the modern theoretical physics speculations concerning the anthropic cosmological principle, and they lie at the very root and core of why any technique or technology of mind manipulation has cosmic implications. They have cosmic implications because man has cosmic implications. That makes us sound a little bit more important now, doesn't it? <laughs> and doesn't it just put a whole new spin on <laughs> the mind manipulation that we're experiencing today? The television, the censorship, the AI algorithms. What if the powers that be really believed this ancient wisdom or this new modern physics that we are indeed a 
point of influence on the cosmos itself. I mean, you sure have to admit that one of the most prevalent aspects of our society is the control of what we think. And just like the elephant, there's a little rope around our opinion of ourselves that is so incredibly hard to break free of. But I think it's worth contemplating. More soon, lovelies. And in the meantime, I just wanted to let you know that the Magical Egypt Black Friday sale is now on with 50% off of all of Magical Egypt products, including the Three Magical Egypt series, The Great Work, Sexual Alchemy of the Thoth Tarot, So if you are looking for a Christmas gift for a loved one or even for yourself, now is a great time to check out the Magical Egypt website. Visit www.magicalegypt.com. 